and we are live. Welcome everybody. It's uh, Sunday lunchtime over here in Spain and it's very late for my dear friends in Australia, Rob McLaren and Trevor Wusencroft, because it's 10 p.m. over there. And on the other hand, it's very early for Dr. Terry Wood because it's only 6 a.m. and that on a Sunday, but he is here. I welcome all everybody present here. We, I, have, I am surrounded by three strong big men who have had all a uh, special part in the life of Dr. Brian McLaren. And today we are going to be talking about the periods where we left off uh, two weeks ago. Today we are going to talk about the period mostly of 2009 till sadly Dr. Brian, passed away, Dr. Brian McLaren passed away in 2016. Now I am just going to have a little look. Yes, sound and visuals are perfect. I see somebody saying so we can get this rolling. Today, as I already said their names, I have with me Dr. I have with me Dr. Terry Wood, I have with me Rob McLaren, and I have with me Trevor Wozencroft. I am not going to introduce them again because I've already done that in the previous interviews. So go and have a look, go and have uh, and review those videos because they were really well done and they had a lot of interesting information. All three of these men are happily married. All of all three have also two kids and all three are still using photonic therapy till the day of today on themselves, on the kids, on the pets, on the horses and so on. Today, I am going to start this uh, interview or this meeting, let's call it this way. We're going to have a little chat together. I'm going to start it with Rob, who sadly uh, could not be here two weeks ago. There was a mix up with uh, dates and, and hours. It's all forgiven because you're here, Rob. Um, so Rob is going to talk a little bit more on about the transition that has taken place so that you can also follow up with what has been said two weeks ago and how it has all evolved in what you're going to hear right now. So Rob, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Would you please be so kind to explain the transition that has happened in the past? We had photonic therapy and then your dad called uh, his system the McLaren method. So it, it was photonic therapy in the McLaren method that evolved later on into advanced photonic therapy. Go back with us into the past and tell us maybe what happened uh, since your father came back uh, from the States and how it has evolved. Uh, uh, thank you, Ava. Um, hello, everybody. Um, good, evening, good evening to all from, from uh, sunny Queensland. Um, Brian uh, and Lita returned from the United States in very late October, November of 2005. Um, and they had been away uh, working in the United States and Canada and Europe for seven years. Um, they, I suppose, took 2006 just to orient themselves uh, where they were going to live, etc. cetera. And um, in that time, and they're now basically turning 70, uh, Brian and Lita built their own home, a very, very beautiful little home on the Queensland coast. Um, and so that sort of absorbed them trying to, to settle down and set themselves up for where they might be in their seventies um, in around 2007. Um, and so, yes, Brian finds himself in the early, in his early seventies, 2008, 2009. Um, and then um, he's still working with McLaren Photonic Therapy. And if I'm not correct, or not incorrect, uh, Trevor, you were doing some workshops with Brian in that in that period, were you not? Yeah, well, when, when he came back home, that's when we that's when we done our big numbers, starting off from from then, and uh, and then I'd done a few of my own. But uh, but that's when I really prior to that I'd had no other than phone calls, and then I, and and, uh, and talking to your sister. I mean, to say I hadn't, I, I was going for quite a few years. Before we have tonic therapy be, before we'd even met. But, well, I knew him from way back, of course, but at the same time, not not actually doing things with the photonic therapy. But it, it's so it's it saved my life my life in many ways. I can assure you. Yes. One of the other interesting things that Brian was doing in that 2007, 8, 2009 period was he began to lecture at universities. So, um, of course. 
He faced stiff uh, conservative veterinary agendas in some of those uh, organisations, but he was able to break through into two universities that I'm aware of and actually present um, universities who are starting to offer complementary um, uh, modalities to introduce their, their students to these complementary modalities, and he was presenting there. So um, he, he, that, that was a, a very important piece to him to be actually be presenting in a, in a, a, a tertiary institutions. Um, in 2000 or early 2010, um, my first little girl was born, the birth of Brian and Lita's granddaughter. It was the, the first of my children, so, um, but it would have been their fourth uh, grandchild. And they um, came down to visit us once that little girl was um, up and about, uh, as it were. And, uh, and it was at that time that we started talking about the idea of, because Brian's now um, you know, about 72 and is interested in um, uh, finding a, a, how, where the business might go forward. Um, and, um, and indeed, he s sold me the, the business. So I saw an opportunity there. And so it was um, in the middle of uh, 2010, uh, we um, began advanced photonic therapy and ceased McLaren photonic therapy. Um, so that's how that sort of came across. And Brian's, uh, uh, Brian's desire just to find a better way uh, out of his, in, into his seventies. One of the key pieces that in the, uh, the kitchen table negotiations was that Brian would remain as the scientific principal. And, um, and he, and he did that. Um, with that, um, we had designed um, the booklet base, so getting away from the books that he used to have, a common format of a series of booklets that we put out on USBs, so we changed the people, the horse and the dog uh, into info packs, um, so that was being changed at that time, so that we would then launch advanced photonic therapy with this um, new approach because that uh, that so those things were being done and then at the end of that year in October and November I started to go and visit um, this wonderful network this sort of gold mine of relationships that uh, Brian had established uh, our, our local representatives uh, uh, firstly in Australia um, but I also took the opportunity to fly to United Kingdom for two weekends and two, two workshops over there with uh, at, staying at the home of Liz and John Scrivener. And, um, and whilst I was on the other side of the planet, I flew for 24 hours down to Spain and met the beautiful Ava. So Ava, you might make some comments there about uh, meeting me for the first time and, and the scary new direction of this, this, cra this crazy young man and advanced photonic therapy perhaps. Well, yeah, for me, for me, it was totally different because I, I'm, I'm the youngest in this group of being using photonic therapy, let's say it, uh, it's honest. But uh, yeah, my problem was, so I found photonic therapy while I was laying in bed because I had a broken back. I had a, a, a horse accident and I fell on a, on a stone and I broke my uh, lumbar. And um, I, was, I was just on, on a laptop passing time while I was laying flat. And that's how I found about photonic therapy. Back then it was still, uh, I was following Pirelli at that time. And as I, as I always do the same, when I find something new, I will always go to the source. Okay, okay, McLaren photonic therapy, what is it? Who makes this? And in the end, I found your father. And by finding your father, um, immediately he, he changed my life, he saved my life. And, and I had told him from the beginning, I said, if this works, because I had been suffering for 14 years, okay, because I had fibromyalgia, I had uh, a disease in my knees, chondromyalgia patellar, in three, third and fourth degree, I needed prothesis in both knees, I had a broken back, I had carpal tunnel syndrome, so I was in a bad shape when I met your father uh, over the internet, and I told him, I said, if this works, because I've already tried everything, I was on the verge of even killing myself because I couldn't live with that pain anymore. I said to him, I said, if this is working, I need to know all about it. So within a month, I was off all my medication and I told, and I asked him, I said, 
when are you coming back to, to, to Europe? I need to take courses. And he says, I'm not at the moment. So, but you can go to Liz Scrivener. And that's how I met Liz Scrivener in the UK. And that's when I did level one, level two, I took some private tutoring. And yeah, after that, I started teaching myself the workshops uh, as of November. It's now 10 years. Since November 2009, I started teaching myself. And then everything changed. Then there was a, that big guy, he's almost two meters high. He's large, strong, totally built out. Comes here with his, his backpack for 24 hours. So we would talk about uh, all the changes and what we could do to make it even better. And so with Rob, we, were, we have been talking about uh, the information packs, that I would be translating information packs. The advantage of me speaking five languages, I was already teaching in, in Dutch and in French and in German and in English and in Spanish. So that also made the uh, a fact that in Europe, little by little, people started to know more about it. And then of course I go back to Europe because then also your father started to make uh, more information packs. Ah, the birds and the alpacas and the cattle. How, how did that all come together? Oh, yes. Um, I, I, was going, I was going to save those because they actually come into an interesting point later on, but, but you've raised the interesting point. Um, Brian uh, started as a veterinarian, and, and Terry may have some affinity here with this, um, in his early veterinary training was about agricultural production, about how veterinarians and the as, as students in the 1950s, 60s and 70s uh, enhanced agricultural production. And over his working life, his career as a veterinarian, he saw the veterinary art change from supporting agricultural production to becoming more about people and their pets. So in the 1950s and 60s, uh, folk didn't have a lot of pets. Um, and so something like birds, um, a bird can cost $20,000. Um, and so that, you know, so for a veterinarian to have any information about supporting anybody with a bird, because people who buy birds um, you know, spend a lot of money. And that same money is spent on alpacas. So uh, Brian recognized um, which, which pockets of pet ownership um, have, have significant turnover, um, have significant interest in, in how the health of their animals. Now we know um, people own cats, but we knew that the, the dog pack can, the dog information pack can support cat owners. But um, camelids, llamas, alpacas, and camels uh, were a very different or a distinct sort of uh, animal um, and need, need support there. As opposed to say per, um, creating a sheep or a pig or a, or a cattle pack. So because you know, in agriculture, the, the desire there to, to assist those animals is, is very, very little. So, so the, the, um, the market sector, I suppose, was, was his, his thoughts in that. And as the scientific principle, he could then uh, commit to, to working on that while we're doing all of the, the other production and distribution and connecting with uh, the folk and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I remember yeah. you always said that you were now the the CEO and you were busy with the marketing, but that Brian was always present for the medical side of the things and yes. to continue his inventions and have more free time to do what he really likes to do so that you could be busy with the marketing. Yeah. Yes. And then you went uh, and then you went to the States too, because I think uh, you met there with uh, Terry and you've been doing uh, workshops there. When did you go to the States? Well, well, I'll certainly, I'll hold, I'll hold that. I'll hold that, Ava, because uh, the first is that um, I'll return to the end of 2010 after I'd left yourself in Europe, um, returned in 2011, and there was an opportunity to continue working with our local reps and that Liz Scrivener actually came out to Australia. We said, uh, Liz, would you like to have an Australian holiday? Um, and for any American person visiting, uh, the distance we travelled would have been um, a round trip of, say, New Orleans to Boston, um, sort of via Savannah and back out through St. Louis, 
to for a um, for Europeans, it would have been a trip from um, uh, London to Athens, uh, sort of via Marseille and then back via Warsaw. So it was just a quick trip, you know, for Trevor and I as Australians, those sort of distances aren't too bad for us to travel from Brisbane to Melbourne. But um, so Liz got a wonderful uh, Australian summer holiday and we were absolutely delighted. And Trevor had the opportunity to meet her uh, at that time. Um, and, and, Trevor, and around this time, Trevor and I did a, were doing a workshop and aligning sort of the things that we were doing. Trevor, do you have any particular memories of, uh, of Liz coming out to see us? Oh, not not really. It was just, yeah, because it was a general chat. Because we really we were sticking to what we were, what we were, you know, all about the business. Really, we we didn't bring any anything uh, from left field sort of thing. And and but it was a great to be able to meet her, and uh, and and sort of find out some things that she's doing. And and I was able to for the thing. The fact is that I've been with Brian. Yeah, like as, as a veterinarian, and right from back from '93, it it has given me a, like a, a big background of his situation and what actually was happening. So I was able to relay some of those things to Liz anyway. But uh, that was the main thing that we done anyway. And I think for her and for ourselves, this idea of this international connection. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, for, yeah, that's right. Yeah. For myself to visit uh, Terry or yourself, Ava, to meet a person from the other side of the world. Uh, for, t for Liz to come and meet all of these Australian local representatives, that there are people all over the world doing this was, was a very exciting piece. The other point uh, that I'd make, uh, Ava, before I, I will be moving to the, your point about United States, um, Brian was also designing torches and he, he was going through a series of torch designs. Um, and as you know, to design something, and Ava's been through this uh, process herself, to design something, to get the suppliers to build it, um, to uh, to get customer feedback and our own feedback on that. So there was a, a, a series of years there of, of going through torch designs. Um, another element that was also happening in around this 2012, 2013 period is that um, um, we undertook an extremely expensive gamble to approach the Therapeutics Goods Administration not dissimilar to the Food and, uh, Food and Drug Administration of the United States to, uh, to offer it as a medical device. Um, we put in, so Brian's scientific uh, background, my wife, Sophie, is a, a professional uh, journalist, communicator and corporate uh, communicator. Um, and so we had some fairly clever people putting together four or five major submissions over an 18 month period. Um, costing us $20,000 for the, for the Australian authorities to say, oh, perhaps not at this time, which was very disappointing um, at that time. But um, that, uh, that uh, and so Brian was behind that. Brian wanted to see if we could get into the, the, the personal space. Um, the, 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 the big driver there was the, the impact of photonic therapy on wrinkles um, and, and, uh, and supporting uh, the sort of the cosmetic element of, um, uh, of, the, of the torch. And, um, and by the end of that, so we're in about 2013, we've been in Australia 18 years and the company's not lifting. It's just not, the, we're doing workshops out there, but it, it, it's in, in our population. Uh, we have a population of 20, 25 odd million or so compared to sort of 300 million Americans. So if you were going to spend one hour you would want to spend it with the United States uh, and get 15 times the result. And so hence us then beginning to reach out to Brian's uh, dear friends, uh, Terry and Norma Wood in Oklahoma City and other folk in the United States and then having to look to step over there. The, um, um, and I'll make one point before I hand over to Terry. Um, we were talking about the cattle USB. And that was the very last USB info pack that Brian worked very hard to put together. Um, and that was actually driven by our friends, Paula Fitzpatrick and Dr. Jack Kibbe up in New Hampshire um, uh, around organic milk production. So organic dairy, dairy cattle. And so um, that's what uh, they, they said, is that possible? And so Brian pulled out all stops 
before I departed on my second United States tour. So in 2014, in April, I went to Oregon and Oklahoma City and met uh, Terry and Norma, for where I'm, for which I'm eternally thankful. Um, and and, the, and he still owes me twenty dollars. And uh, and then I went back in 2015 in August. Um, and um, and they and so I'll hand over to Terry. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Terry, tell us more about these visits with. Uh... <laughs> we don't know it all. This is a family show, Terry Woods. Family show. <laughs> <laughs> well, what stays on tour. <laughs> it was a. Uh... It, it was uh, one of the highlights of my life because I was busy at the clinic and I had to send Norma, go pick him up at the airport. And she said, what does he look like? And it's like, he's an Australian. He'll have this aura of light shining around him. You can't miss him. And so she, she finally, I said, go to the information desk and announce. And so uh, he came up and wished her a good day and she knew she'd struck gold that that was, that was Rob. He was here in Oklahoma, but uh we had a great time. He spent a week with us and, uh, you know, we, we put on workshop there at the uh, therapeutic course uh, place there in El Reno, uh, had really good, really good uh, responses. And, and uh, I, I think the highlight of it was just getting to know Rob because uh, Rob's had a very interesting life. He's fulfilled the Chinese proverb, may you have an interesting life. And he was able to uh, uh, regale us with some stories uh, of his uh, travels. And, you know, you, uh, they mentioned your backpack, but if when Rob comes to visit you, he has this backpack and on a little part of it, it's all the countries that he's visited. And I think there were seven or eight there, I believe. Uh, yes, but that yes. was always, that's always a highlight. I got to see the backpack and see where he's been since he's been here. Uh, but uh, uh, Rob kept us very entertained. I almost didn't look forward to supper time because he would be telling stories and we would be laughing so hard. We were crying. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> And we, we, when he ended up leaving, I, I think he had all of us wrapped around his legs going, no, you can't go, you can't go. <laughs> but it, it, was a, it was a wonderful time. And I, I feel so privileged to have, have met you and, and especially continuing the work of your father. That's nice to hear. One of the, allow me to return a compliment to Terry. One of the st stories that you've shared with me, Terry, was there was a point in time when perhaps you were in your late forties and Brian's in his sixties. So there's about a 15 year, diff year difference. And you, you described it sort of um, receive, you know, you were, you were at a point in your career where you were receiving uh, all this information because you were now, you had now so much experience since uh, graduating from university, 20, 25 years of, of hands-on experience that maybe some of the things in the lecture notes don't really or do or don't really apply and then what you were sharing with me all as well was now you're a man of that seniority um uh, and so you were describing how young veterinarians at 45 were now asking you uh in their late 40s uh that same knowledge and sort of i uh, just thought you know um we've got another wise person with lots of experience and and so we're uh, yeah, very thankful that, that you were there and uh, and I could see um, how you know the how APT at that time really you know could could work in the United States could work with a uh, being fronted by a veterinary surgeon um, because I felt that was at that time was the um, a, a way forward so it was really great to meet you and to hear your stories of, of how much assistance uh, you were providing to other young veterinarians. And, and Terry took me along to an Oklahoma State uh, a Veterinary Association meeting. And for me to sit and listen to the issues and concerns of, 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 medical, of veterinary practitioners and, and, and what faces them and the, and the ethical and legal requirements of that was, was uh, for something I was, I was deeply appreciative of. Uh, so thank you, Terry. Mm. Uh, Ava, you're on mute. You're on mute, Ava. No, thank you. There was some noise in here, so I muted myself for a minute. But <laughs> Terry, now that we're talking with you, let me just ask you a question and, and continue with you on this, because you told me that in 2014 you had an initial bout of heart failure. 
uh, first of all, I would like to know what the forecast was uh, that your doctor, of, uh, to who you went for your heart failure, what he, what did he tell you? What were your chances? What was your future going to be? Well, they, they didn't actually tell me I was going to die, but uh, the nurse, <laughs> uh, I spent three days in the hospital and uh, the nurse uh, asked me, she said, do you have your advanced directive done? And I said, no. And she goes, uh, you need to do that tonight. There might not be tomorrow. You need to do it now. So uh, my ejection fraction, that's a measure of how well your heart is pumping, was at 5 to 10. People start dying when it's at 15. And most people are dead by the time it's at 5 to 10. Um, they, uh, the three days in hospital they, with diuretics, they got 30 pounds of fluid out of me. Um, you know, my chest and my, and my abdomen and I could breathe and move. And it was really kind of a unique experience because everybody asked me, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. But I wasn't, I was almost dead. Um, and they, I was uh, uh, hooked up with a uh, heart failure doctor who does, they're the only place in, in Oklahoma that does the LVADs, the left ventricular assist device and transplants because they thought I was gonna have to have that. Um, and uh, of course I uh, started, uh, doing the torch and I'd talked with Brian over the phone and, and, you know, the outlook I was getting was pretty negative, pretty grim. Um, and Brian said, you know, as, uh, Australians say, it's like, ah, oh, no worries, mate, you'll be bright as rain. Uh, so he, <laughs> uh, we talked about it and he showed, told me some extra points and, and, uh, you know, I started treating myself and it, and it took a while, but within, I believe it was a year and a half, my ejection fraction was up to 50, uh, which, was pretty amazing. It's, it's low normal. And, uh, you know, every time when I go see my heart failure doctor, she's just kind of shaking her head because most, when I'm in the waiting room, most of the patients there have the LVAD installed and are waiting for a transplant. And the ones with the transplant, of course, have their masks on. And uh, so I feel I'm reminded of that conversation every time I go in uh, to see her because the, the outlook was was very bleak and, and I honestly believe that uh, the, the photonic therapy played a huge part in, in my recovery. And you're still using it? Oh, absolutely. I, I treat myself once a week. It'll be either today or tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, I, I rarely miss. It's, you know, I don't want to die because I was stupid and lazy. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Trevor, let's get to you for a moment. Well, at least for a moment. Uh, <laughs> you told me uh, in, in the preliminaries to this interview, you told me that in the period as of 2009 to 2016, you were doing more field days and shows. Now, I have never been to such a, a show or a field day. We don't have them over here. So for all the others here in Europe and maybe America, I don't know how it goes over there. Tell us how this is going on in Australia and what you were doing, because it was always related to photonic therapy. So tell us about that. Well, well, actually, we, you know, it, it goes a lot further back than that than when we first started. But it, this is this we carried right through this period. But the field days that we were attending were agricultural field days, and uh, my wife and I had uh, uh, we had a truck and trailer, forty foot truck and trailer and had a lot of, uh, um, cat, well, mainly cattle and goat gear. But in those, the, you know, in the latter part of it, uh, the company that I was uh, doing this for, I was on, on a commission, and we were, uh, it wasn't just the normal stuff. It was all uh, uh, pneumatics, and it was all on running on air. But the, it, the thing about it was, it was able to, it gives me an out to go to all these field days and, have my photonic therapy with me all the time. Doesn't matter where we were. And we would go right through from New South Wales to uh, Victoria and, and back into um, South Australia. Now this, because you had a pretty captive audience in that type of people that you had there, because you'd, that, they're the major field days in, in Australia that we went to. We didn't go just to the weekend ones. We, we go from, you know, sometimes, I would leave uh, a heap of gear with my wife and she would be at one field day and then I'd go to another one for two or three days and then come back and finish up with the one with her. And then we'd have a week and I'd go and visit uh, her son because we, it was a bit like, we were a bit like Darby and Joan because 
we knew a lot of people in the area, but it, and it meant that we were doing a lot of travelling. We'd done it for over six years, and we were doing a lot of travelling. But it did. It means that uh, the add-on was the photonic therapy. Uh, so, I mean, if, we, it, if you just didn't run into what you expected, it didn't matter because you were going to be there anyway. And and, and also that uh, we used to attend the uh, Equitana, which is the major horse show in Australia. Um, you know, you get forty, sixty thousand visitors there over the four days and uh, each year uh, the, we would go to that as well and we had when we got that very first uh, new light of Brian's we actually um, that's where we launched it down there and and I and I was also as a presenter at that uh, for photonic therapy at Equitana as well and so uh, we've done a lot of other you know, straight horse shows. And this is where in, in these later years that we've been able to pick up a lot of their, uh, uh, a lot of their new customers. And, and actually one that I got uh, is, is actually put me in contact with some exceptionally good racing uh, uh, clientele, which uh, we hope to con continue with because we're, we're doing, I would not be able to, if I didn't know somebody that knew somebody, we wouldn't been able to get in, but, uh, but it, did, it it's amazing what we've been able to do for people. But it's a, but and also amazing that when you do something for some people uh, and in places and, and others see it happens and think, oh, that's fantastic. But they still don't want to look outside the square. They they just they just don't seem to get it. So that was basically what, what we what we have been doing. And then we uh, um, yeah that's when when Brian came home. That's when I I done a lot of workshops with him. Yeah. That I was just going to talk about them. So once Brian was back from uh, the States, you did workshops with him, uh, only horse workshops or, and, and was uh, that locally or was that further away? No, it, it was more locally, but it was mainly horse, but we do, we do a bit of human and, and, a, and a bit of dog, but basically all these were, were horse people. And so that, uh, uh, and because, yeah, until he come back, I hadn't had hands on stuff, but I had, uh, we had the videos that uh, Rob and Brian done, the original ones. And I may say, I spent hours and hours. And because we were away at these field days, and uh, you, you do have a lull period in there. So it means that, you know, I just about wore the, the at that time, uh, there were videos. So I just about wore the damn things out. So, but really, the amount of time I put into it, majority of people, you know, the board that had the system in, in the old days, that, that they wouldn't put the time in to do what you've got to do. But uh, so you need to get out there to, you know, cut all the little the bits, the bits and pieces out that they don't need. But then we had, yeah, we would have had, you know, six, seven or eight field, uh, uh, not so workshops there, but that was all in, in here, more or less in the immediate area. It, uh, we, we didn't go away. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit more about the stories about what happened uh, during those workshops or when you were with Brian? Because you told me about show horses and race horses having back problems and sacroiliac problems. Tell, tell us a bit about what would you be doing then? Well, well, one of the, the things with uh, one of the workshops we was at with Brian one day that uh, we'd, uh, this particular horse had, he, he was out in the hips. But not real bad, but he was out, and he went down. And he said, "Well, he when he was in America, there was some uh, uh, trainee vets and at a, 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 a big uni, and uh, on this one particular horse was out real bad in the hips. So what they done was they because we only had the the original torch in those days. Just about every trainee was there and worked on this horse around the you know around the rack sacroiliac. But then by the end of the day." that horse was standing as square as they come, but it was continuous. So this is where you may remember I did show you, oh, I think we just had a private talk one night, when it, I would have in my hand at least three of those torches and you were doing the same thing with four. And that's, you know, like uh, I've developed, look, that's it. <laughs> and I've developed bigger ones now to, to cover a bigger area. But uh, uh, but he was, because we'd stand well, yeah, you just wouldn't have the time to stand there with just one torch. But you would, you know, like by having the three torches, I was able to do a job that now takes me about uh, two minutes or a minute to do, uh, and it take me about five or well, 
five, 10, 15 minutes. But when you've only got one torch, it takes you a long time to be able to do the job. But, uh, but I do remember there was uh, uh, one time I went to, uh, uh, I had some other business I was doing with these people and he, it was late one evening and he uh, said, oh, he says, uh, that red light she was talking to me about, he says, uh, do you think it'd be any good for this horse? I said, well, now sort of what's wrong with it? And he says, oh, and got a bad back problem. And so we went and it was pitch dark and we put the lights on when this poor horse was standing there in the corner of the stall with his head down, feed was in front of it, hadn't even hardly touched the feed. And all along its back, we have a product here, which we call Tough Rock, and it's a, a mineral. And it, it, if you put it on the tendons, it pulls out the, uh, um, well, you know exactly where the tendons, the problems are, because it's, it, it stays moist. But they haul it all down the back of this horse, all across the spine. And he says, oh, she's racing next week. Uh, no, week after next. And I says, he says, oh, she's in full training now, but we have to give her a quarter zone. The vet gives her a quarter zone before she races. And I mean, so to me, it's a welfare issue. But anyway, we washed all this stuff off. We got the torch and I just sat on the back for about oh, two or three minutes. Then I done gave her a general treatment and she just kept wanting to move away from me. And I thought, gee, she's a bit odd. Anyway, time I finished, I, I just stood up, leaned against the stable door and the horse went straight to water, had a drink and put his head straight in, started drinking. And, and this fellow says to his son, he says, you see what she's doing? He says, because the son doesn't take much notice, I don't think. He says, well, well, what do you mean? He says, well, that horse takes all day or all night just about to get half its feed. Wood doesn't even do three parts of its feed. He says, and now look at it. She was going from the water, she done first, then into the feed, then back into the water, and then back into the feed. I, just hard to believe. So anyway, about a week later, I had to be down again and pick up some more product off of them. And I said, well, I'll do that horse while you're here. And he brings this horse out. And she was virtually rearing and going. And, and I says, hey, hang on. I says, you're not giving me a, another one that you want to fix. He says, oh, no. He says, I changed the feed. Now, there you have. They just don't, still didn't want to accept, you know, like what had actually happened. There's no way changing feed. I mean, so she's been on, this has been like this for, you know, 12 months nearly. And they wanted to get a few more races out of it. So it was an amazing, yeah, like situation, yeah, like with her and the uh, uh, the, the sacroiliac, uh, yeah, w was in a mess too. But uh, the main problem, and oh, that's right. And then he was having trouble with attendance. But the main problem was because the sacroiliac was so bad and the back was so bad, she's trying to hold herself tight and she's trying to pull herself forward. So you're going to have tendon problems. Very hard to get through to some of these these people. That's a uh, uh, well, to me, it just it's as plays as plain as the nose on your face. But some people just can't seem to get it. But it's an incredible, it's incredible what we've been able to do with with the torch, with the uh, with these massive sacroiliac problems. With we and like the better the horse, the worse they are. Because I've had horses here that have been retired from the track, and people got me to come and have a look, just to look them over. There's nothing wrong with. Yeah, you know, like the sacrum at all. And I said, well, I bet this horse never won the races. Oh, how do you know that? I said, well, it's obvious. Yeah, look, like, because the worse they are, their back is, it, it, it gets really bad. Yeah. That's, that's basically, but those, those sort of things are replicating time at a number. You know, like you, it, it's a continuous thing. And people say to you, and I have another product that we, well, I talk to quite often on here, and you say things to people, and they say, oh, how do you know about that about my horse? We well, don't, but there's thousands of them out there. You know, like might be exactly the same thing, but they are something very, very similar. Yeah. But uh, but anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you for all that information, Rob. I think uh, it's up to you to continue the story of what has been going on. Sadly. Yes, the um, we're we're reaching that part of the story where. Um, um, uh, talking about Brian's illness, and it's um, worth going back just momentarily over um, my last trip to the United States. As I said, I was fortunate enough to get to Terry in Oklahoma as well as Oregon in April of 2014, um, and then again in the August of 2015. And in the preparation for of, of Brian racing to get the cattle 
USB done for the organic milk or organic dairy folk in New Hampshire um, was where he was starting to recognize he was having difficulty with words. Um, and um, neither he or I sort of twigged to the, to the piece of the stroke. He just felt that he was working so hard, putting it all together, was just tired. Um, he's, um, and, um, and so off we went to America and I'm there in the United States. And although I'm presenting to folk, I'm very conscious of the conversations around the edges about what are the opportunities um, to bring advanced photonic therapy, uh, therapy to the United States. And in the New Hampshire uh, workshop, I was very fortunate to meet a, uh, a US a veterinary surgeon who was a, a veterinary consultant. And, um, and we were to meet a number of people as we did in every one of the workshops, um, some amazing opportunities um, that, um, that didn't exist in Australia um, and, and just stumbling into networks. And I'm sort of with this gentleman, he's aware of, you know, we could break through that um, to, to a new level with our business. Uh, because we, we're, we're all aware of the power of the modality and its ability to heal, but how do we use it as a, um, a, a commercial vehicle to be able to inform more people um, than, we ha than we are? And, and here we were. So this gentleman and myself are very sort of excited where these crazy opportunities, you know, I, near, near million dollar opportunities are sort of right there at our feet. It's all very exciting. Let's talk about it some more. And so I went, I went, I returned to Australia. And very soon after I'd returned to Australia, it appeared that Brian had had a stroke. Um, very soon after in, in the September of, 26, of 2015. And, um, and went through that, that whole uh, uh, stroke piece. Um, and he re rehabilitated very quickly. So we're being told all of the timeframes around stroke um, and he's sort of exceeding their ability to get better and to rehabilitate and um, et cetera. Um, he's obviously concerned for uh, Lida, my mother, his wife. And um, so we're trying to administer his life and her life as, uh, as his health is rapidly declining. By um, the end of the year, the, the doctors thought, oh, it's, it's, things seem to be going backwards. Let's just have another uh, scan. And um, it was appeared that the, the little um, the clot that had originally shown up in September by February had grown to half of his skull. So, we're, so it was a brain tumor. He, had, he did, had, had not had a, a stroke. He'd had a, a brain tumor. And it had grown to about the size of a coffee cup. And it was basically pushing his brain into half of his skull. Um, and the man had become a toddler, a, a, you know, a, a small child. So they raced him down to hospital, um, removed the growth. And, um, and so I know you've said you've got some st stories uh, beyond. But one of the key things is that he came back. And it was quite funny to see a person's, the plasticity of someone's brain expand back into the, into the space. Um, and he returned. He returned out of that, that person sort of trapped in that sort of dark place. And he could see that you could see that he was in this dark place, but he can't get out of it. Uh, and here he is, he's returned. And um, so that was um, amazing. And, but recognizing the um, declining success rate of, uh, of uh, therapies available for that sort of advanced form of cancer and a man of that age is sort of a, a well over his mid 70s he's into his late 70s um, decided oh no I'll, I'll, I, I won't do that um, um, and if it's not a stroke <laughs> you'll, you'll enjoy this one Terry uh, if I don't have a stroke if it's only a cancer let's go straight to the pub <laughs> <laughs> let's go and have a gin <laughs> so uh, so straight to the pub we went um and don't tell your mother <laughs> and, and um and uh so for four weeks he was back with us and over that 
and from his time of his surgery to the time he passed away was eight weeks. So it, it rapidly grew again and, and took him from us. And so he passed away in the April of 2016. Hmm. I'm getting yeah, so the, well, there we are. Yes. I'm getting cold shivers just listening to it because that period for me was really uh, special because it was in that summer that I uh, talked to your father of me coming over to Australia and be there. Uh, but that wasn't in the summer. He, he wasn't sick. It, it was by the end of, of uh, August because the reason why I wasn't able to travel the years before is of one dog <laughs> that I really could not leave alone for a week. Okay. And he died on August the 17th. And I, I always have promised Brian, I said, the day that, hold on, uh, I need to change the screen. Okay. The day that my boomer isn't there anymore, that's the day that we make an, an appointment and I'm coming over because then I would have been free. I had many other animals in the house, but Boomer was a problem. He just could not be without me. And I'm a dog that's really old. I'm not just going to say, okay, I'll see you in a month. I couldn't do that. My heart, after a few hours, my heart is already bleeding. But I had been talking with your dad uh, at the end uh, of August and organizing it. And then he told me, no, you can't come right now because summer is going to start here. It's going to be so hot. And he said the best time of year to come then would be February, March of 2016. And I really, I was exchanging emails with your father the whole time. I have hundreds, many, many hundreds of emails. And I was really blessed because as he knew how passionate I was, when in, whenever somebody was writing to him and he would answer them with a solution, he would put me in a copy because he knew I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know more. And I was keeping a library. So all of his stuff would stay alive. And I knew something was wrong because suddenly he was sending me empty emails. Yes. I said, what's going on? So he sends me an email and there's nothing in there. And okay, that he does that once, you can say, okay, he forgot okay, or something went wrong with the email, but then another one came was empty and another one came that was empty. I said, something is completely wrong here. This is not Brian. This is not the man I know. That's when I contacted you, Rob, uh, uh, and you told me about the stroke. And then suddenly your father started writing again. And he said, yeah, I've had a stroke, but luckily uh, my wife, Laida, she immediately put the torch on me and I recuperated so much quicker than they expected in the hospital. And uh, yeah, you, we were happy again. Yes, okay, so I will be able to go. Uh, I will be able to, to travel uh, abroad. But uh, yeah, no, it was uh, quickly downhill again, sadly enough. And, and it's also known that with these kinds of, of uh, tumors, uh, if they can't take it all, it's once you touch it, it comes back so quickly. Uh, and become so big that, uh, yeah, it was uh, just giving him some extra time. I've been really, for months, my, my students, my people around me really know me and really have seen me really, really angry. Because I really said at that time when it happened, I said that this was a medical error, okay? If they had done what they had to do the moment that he had his stroke, they should have known that it was not a stroke but a tumor. So I was so angry. Why did they wait so long to, to make a, a scan again to see what was going on? Because I really uh, was so angry that I wasn't able to have your father longer with us and, and help us more. And I've been really, really angry for a long time. Yeah. Because he saved my life and he has saved the life of so many others. And Medic science, Western medicine has let him down. We, we need Western medicine, okay? We need them we, because we need our x-rays. We need the, the scans to have a diagnosis. So we need to work together. But I mean, I really was so pissed that, damn, this man has done so much. And then he just needs those doctors once to have a correct diagnosis if that correct diagnosis would have been done uh, in time, maybe we would still have had them. So that made me angry for a long time. Okay, 
Uh, I still believe he's here. I still believe I, I receive information from him and that makes me stronger. And that's also what I, so to speak, felt. Don't worry, I'm not gone. So um, yeah, we're just continuing his life work. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, to give it a happy ending, well, that's, that's, that's impossible. We can't have a happy ending, but what we could do is just all of us tell a little story that puts a smile on our, on our face. Like, yeah, like your joke. Well, it's not a joke. You were serious, Rob, when you said that. Your father said, if it's not a stroke, it's cancer. Let's go to the pub. At least it gives us a smile on our face. And, and I know, Terry, you have such wonderful uh, small stories that, that Brian told you. I, I remember the one. Uh, something about, uh, what was it again? A, 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 a wedding dress or a white dress that became, well, you know what I'm talking about, or the, the story about the ACL injury. All of you, you all have stories. We have to keep these stories alive, certainly also for Rob's children, so that later on they can go back and see this uh, interview and say, oh, my grandfather did that or said that. So go ahead. Yeah, he, I, I had asked uh, uh, Brian, you know, how did you get started about, you know, with the idea of acupuncture? Because he, you know, like me, he received Western training. And he said that, uh, uh, of course, uh, he said that he'd uh, had an ACL injury on his right knee. Well, you know, I tease him. I said, well, in Australia, the land of perfection and all that, they do everything backwards. So when he gets into his truck, <laughs> he has to push off with his right knee. When he gets out of his truck, he has to land on his right knee and he said it was very worrisome and so he went to the medico and said you know and they said yeah you've torn your acl and he said well what can we do well you know you can have surgery and rehab and you'll be fine and he said well how long is that going to take and he said i think it was four to six months and he said i don't have that kind of time he said i you know he said he had to practice the size of five times the state of oklahoma and he said two young children he said I, there's no way I cannot be gone for that length of time. And in his travels in the outback, he said there was there was an old Chinaman that did acupuncture, and how and he ended up in his shop. And he had received uh, he you know whenever he was through I guess uh, through the area he would get a treatment. And uh, to my knowledge, he never did have surgery uh, on that ACL, and he was recovered. And I I think I I don't know what year that happened, but I think you know his personal experience is what uh, piqued his interest. And then, he, you know, he talked about, you know, just stories of, of veterinary life. Of course, we could share, you know, what had happened to me, what had happened to him. And, and he said that one time he, uh, uh, it was, a, a, there was a big horse race. And I know when in the U.S. when they have the Kentucky Derby, the women wear the big hats. And whatever this race was in Australia, every, all the women would wear very nice dresses. And the whole nation was just riveted on this race. And he'd been called out to do a C-section on this cow. And of course, Lita was with him and she had on her beautiful white race day dress. And in the process, there were some complications. So he said, there's Lita holding most of this cow's intestines in her lap with this new white dress. And needless to say, the calf lived, but the dress did not. <laughs> <laughs> But as one veterinarian to another, I understood that because I ruined some things too. And I put my wife in some bad situations uh, helping me. So it, it was it was really good. And, and you know, you've talked, Rob uh, and uh, Trevor, about the distances. Uh, you know, Brian called it the tyranny of distance because of the, you know, taking a 3,000 kilometer car trip is, you know, like me going to 7-Eleven. You know, you just, if you want to get somewhere, that's what you got to do. And, uh, he said one farm call, he hadn't been out to the station and they told him, you know, it was kind of like when I was in Southern Oklahoma, it's like, yeah, you get to the orange and guard, orange and uh, uh, black cattle garden, you know, that's, you turn left there and it's like, okay. So he got these instructions. He said he'd driven so far, he burned through one tank of fuel and then he burned it, refueled, was halfway through the next tank. And he said, you know, there's nothing, it, they were out away from everything and he said I've got to see this 
cattle guard pretty soon or I'm going to be out here forever. So he, he said he finally saw the right cattle guard, made the trip, got to the station and got it taken care of. But he said he was a little bit worried that he might not might not make it. But yeah, it, it was really a lot of fun trading trading stories with Brian. Trevor? Yeah, well, the, the thing that will always stick with, with me, uh, with Brian, about Brian with me is he said to me one day, uh, and this this will really always stick in your mind, is that uh, when we just, I think we was at a workshop, we, uh, we was going through things, and he says, well, yeah, this is the formula for doing this and this and this, and, but it doesn't matter what it is. If you're working on something and that formula is not working, you've got to be prepared to be like a gymnast. And you've got to sit down, have a good think about it, and look at it and doing it another way. He says, because everything you do, as which I keep trying to tell people now, is that everything's individual. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a person, a horse, dog, whatever, they're all individuals. And just because 10 dogs or 10 horses are worked with that particular formula, we have in the book, and this is where it gets back down to all the formulas are there to do a certain job, but it doesn't mean that that exact formula is going to be for that exact, although you think that's what's wrong with the animal, it doesn't mean that's how it's going to work. He says, so you've got to always be treating everything as an individual and you might start with, not you might start, you start with what you think is the one, the formula that you need or we've got in the book, but you must be prepared to sit down and have a look at it because that body might be working a bit differently. That's something you'll always stick with, not just because of, photonic therapy or in you know using a red light but everything that we do and i try to talk to people about you know when they're treating a horse or with uh, or a diet that i've formulated or something that diet may fit that horse but it doesn't fit another one exactly it's exactly the same scenario we weren't talking about horse feeds or anything else we're only talking about photonic therapy but it's exactly the same with everything so that's that's something I could, i'll always and i could even take it to the day to exact the place that we're on and where we were actually working on the cattle uh, or not saddle cattle on the horses it's it's sort of it's one of those things that always sticks in your mind that that that's the, that's the one thing take it if you take everything away that's the one thing that'll always stick with me Rob. I come. Um, well, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Trevor, for, for remembering Brian and that, the way that's fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have two quick ones. What you, one, you made the comment about uh, granddaughters. Um, Brian was always keen on sugar, uh, grew up in our cane, uh, sugar cane farming communities uh, here in Australia, and uh, was always a very keen supporter of sugar cane farmers uh, with his three sugars in his coffee and things like that. So uh, always in the center console of, the, of his vehicle, always had lots of lollies or candy um, ready to go. So when he was not well, um, it, it, bringing him, um, do you have them in, in Europe or in America, um, jelly snakes? Yeah. Terry, do you recognize a jelly snakes or like a long? Um, I, yeah, I think they call them gummy worms here. <laughs> gummy worm that's the, we're getting close so the gummy worms jelly snakes he, he was when he was not well uh, he very much enjoyed those in hospital um, and then to bring the little girls with him uh, with us they were delighted that they could sit with their granddad and eat uh, gummy worms and jelly snakes and um, and so even to, even now uh, on, on the appropriate occasions um, to, to bring out that's his legacy to those children They'll always eat a packet of, uh, of, of or, or one or two uh, gummy worms and um, they'll remember their grandfather uh, because they, they would sit beside him. And um, while he's eating them, he's eating the, the, the snakes with the little girls, um, I'm cleaning his false teeth, which is also a, a, a big memory for a four-year-old little girl to see, that, see their father cleaning their grandfather's teeth over there. Yeah, so... Uh, and the, the final the final comment I'd, I'd quickly make is um, possibly for all of us, um, this idea of a second chance. There's this person who uh, has, has lost everything um, and suddenly after, in his particular circumstance after this, this surgery, um, he's given a second chance at being himself. Um, and and what's it, what is it like how rarely life deals us 
a second chance. And Terry was kind enough to share us his um, harrowing ordeal and, and over your, your own harrowing ordeal. Um, and then you get this second chance and, and how we, we make the most of that in our own special way. Um, each person will play those cards differently, but um, uh, that, that was a very powerful takeaway from me as just a life story. Here's one man, he's got, it was, he didn't know it was only to be four weeks. Um, and, and, and what do we do with those, those chances and, and how uh, we must be ready to grab them and, um, and here are folk right here tonight who, who have done just that as well. So um, that's a little you know, life piece, I suppose, I'd like to share that I took away from his illness at the very end of his life, yeah. Well, and, and I wanted to add too, I was so, because at when Brian, just before he passed, you were due to come back to Oklahoma and uh, mm. help put on a class. And then uh, that's when you wrote, emailed me and said, well, uh, Brian's very sick. And and uh, and I, I was very uh, touched and appreciative how you said that you were, um, as he, you were by his bedside, that you would read him poems and stories of the outback that brought back memories of his youth. And that was, that must have been a very special time. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, but to have that time to spend with your father and to share and to, you know, we, life's a circle and we came back to his origins, you know, on the station. Uh, that must yes. have been a very special time. And, and thank you so much uh, for doing that for him. I know it had to mean a lot for him. Yes. yes, thank you. Yeah. And on these words, we are going to end today's uh, interview, today's meeting. We will come back once more in about two weeks to talk uh, again in group for those who can be present. We're going to talk about what has happened after Dr. Brian McLaren passed away, what the evolution has been, and what we are foreseeing for the future. So if you like this uh, meeting, please share it with your friends. It's always good to know when photonic therapy or red light therapy and photonic therapy, the McLaren method has started, what the whole history has been. And just like, like this video, share it with your friends, and I hope to see you and my colleagues here, Rob McLaren, Trevor Woosencroft, and Dr. Terry Wood, again in about two weeks. That's it for today. Have a great weekend, have a great Sunday, and see you soon. Bye for now. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Ava.